With Israel and Hamas's ceasefire now over, rockets once again lit up the skies over the Gaza Strip today. I'm Ellison Barber in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. The delicate truce between Israel and Hamas has collapsed, with both sides blaming each other for violating the week-long ceasefire. Now Israel has quickly resumed its aerial bombardment of Gaza, leaving nearly 180 Palestinians dead, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. And the fate of dozens of hostages now up in the air. The Israel Defense Forces say, say they have hit over 200 targets in Gaza today, including Hans Yunus, where caravans of displaced Palestinians have relocated. People there are now scrambling to get out after Israel ordered Gazans to evacuate several southern cities, hinting at a broader military operation, despite international calls to protect civilian lives. Israel's resumed combat operations, Qatar, who helped broker the week-long truce, says talks are ongoing for another pause in fighting, but so far no indication that that would even happen. Uh, we also saw throughout this deal, this truce, the return of 100 hostages who had been held by Hamas in exchange for 240 Palestinians that were held in Israeli prisons. These latest rounds of attacks by Israel, they are aimed at southern Gaza. Since the beginning of the war, Israel has urged Palestinians to flee to southern Gaza, saying that is where civilians would be safe. But they haven't been. Airstrikes in the south, while less frequent than those in northern Gaza, have continued. Roughly 1.7 million people have been displaced in Gaza since this war began. And a military campaign in the south could mean that hundreds of thousands of people could be displaced all over again and maybe not have anywhere to go. Then there's the death toll in Gaza, already staggeringly high. The health ministry there says over 15,000 Palestinians have died in this war. Now residents fear things will only get worse, and they say they are running out of options to seek safety. NBC's David Noriega joins us now from Tel Aviv. So, David, break this down for us. What went wrong here, and is there any chance we might see another ceasefire soon? Yeah, Allison, Israel says that the talks broke down because Hamas refused to hand over the last group of hostages that would have allowed the truce to be extended. Uh, they say that Hamas then fired rockets into Israeli territory early this morning and that that prompted them to reinitiate their military campaign in Gaza. Hamas blames Israel. Uh, we're seeing each side blame the other here. As far as whether we could see another ceasefire anytime soon, it does not look particularly promising. What diplomatic sources are telling NBC News is that those talks are at this point effectively suspended and we aren't hearing any positive indication from either the Qataris or the Egyptians that they might resume anytime soon. So from where I'm standing right now, something significant is going to have to change before we can see another cessation to the hostilities. Allison. So, David, there are still about 140 hostages being held inside of Gaza. The Red Cross, they were supposed to be able to visit uh, the hostages for proof of life, to check on them. Did that happen? Ellison, as far as anybody knows, it did not happen, no. And I've spoken to several of those families in the last few days. This is, every single one of them is talking about this. They're all very anxious angry and frustrated about the fact that part of this deal ostensibly was allowing the Red Cross to visit their loved ones, right? I mean, the, the way they feel is if they're not going to see their release at minimum, the, the, the thing that could provide them some amount of relief is knowing that they're alive, knowing something about their medical condition. And the only way for that to happen would be for the Red Cross to access them. That hasn't happened. So they're very frustrated about that. In general, a lot of the families of hostages wanted the ceasefire to be extended essentially indefinitely until all of the the hostages were released. A lot of them talk about essentially getting the hostages out at any price, even if that means uh, what's often referred to as an all for all deal, all hostages for all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli custody. That obviously is not what's happening. And that leaves those families in a really excruciating position where the war is happening again and they have no idea where, you know, whether they might expect to see any light at the end of the tunnel in terms of there being another opportunity to get them out. 
David, let's talk about the Palestinian civilians inside of Gaza for a minute. They, in the south, they were initially told by Israel to head south of the Gaza or Wadi River, that that would be an area where they should go to try and stay safe. They have been told to evacuate parts of southern Gaza. What's the reaction been there? And is there, realistically, any safe place for Palestinian civilians to go inside of Gaza? Yeah, so just first of all, in terms of the ferocity of the fighting today, not only did the war resume, it resumed in full force. According to the health ministry in Gaza, 178 people died just in the less than 24 hours of fighting since the ceasefire collapsed, many more hundreds injured. The usual caveat applies that we can't independently verify those numbers. The, the health ministry says that most of those are women and children. Again, not something we can verify, but that's what that's what they're telling us. Um, as far as the evacuations, you're right. This has been the pattern. Israel tells people to evacuate. They wind up going to places that also wind up being subject to bombing campaigns and wind up being dangerous. That this is what we this is what we hear from civilians inside Gaza. They say that there is nowhere for them to go that is safe. Not only that, what Israel describes as evacuations, a lot of other countries, particularly in the region, uh, describe as forced displacements. That's what the, the the Egyptian foreign ministry said in a in a pretty long and pretty angry statement that it released today in response to the collapse of the ceasefire. It repeatedly warned Israel against, in its words, the consequences of continued forced displacement of Palestinians inside Gaza, and also alluded to what uh, the Egyptian foreign ministry fears is the possibility that uh, Palestinian residents inside Gaza might be displaced outside of Gaza, which, given the geography, probably means being displaced into Egypt. So those are the different ways that, that this question of evacuations uh, get talked about by by, by different actors in this conflict. Allison? David Noriega in Tel Aviv for us. Thank you. Tonight, we are hearing from one of the three Palestinian college students shot in Vermont over Thanksgiving weekend. Kenan Abdul Hamid, Hamid and two of his friends were shot last Saturday night in Burlington near the University of Vermont's campus. Two of the three were wearing traditional Palestinian scarves, and all of them were speaking Arabic. Kenan described the moments leading up to the shooting in an interview with NBC News Now anchors in Clay SMW. Watch. We walked around the block, and on the way back uh, uh, across the sidewalk, we see this man standing on his porch, looking away. Uh, he turned around, and as soon as he saw us, he ran down the steps, pulled out a pistol, and started shooting. Uh, he first shot my friend Tahseen, which I soon heard the thud of his body on the ground and him start screaming, and that was my signal to run. Uh, then I soon heard another pistol shot while running hit Hisham, and his thud uh, hit the floor. So uh, I jumped the fence, and I believe that's when he shot me. 48-year-old Jason Eaton has been charged in the shooting. Prosecutors are still deciding whether to treat the incident as a hate crime. Here's Zin Clay with more of her interview. Hey there, Ellison. There has been an alarming spike in incidents of harassment and violence against Arab, Muslim, Palestinian Americans, or those who are perceived to be in those communities. One of the most recent incidents had to do with three Palestinian American men. The three friends were here studying at colleges in the United States. One of those students injured was Kinan Abdal Hamid. He's out of the hospital now, and earlier today I spoke with him about his experience. Take a listen. Do you ever think anything like this could happen on American soil? I certainly hope not. I have heard of other Palestinians being uh, beat up, stabbed, or humiliated. Uh, but I certainly didn't expect to be shot. Kanan tells me he never expected this to happen on U.S. soil, and he is still recovering today. Now, as for his two friends, they remain in the hospital. The hospital told me this morning that both men are in stable condition. However, one of them may forever lose the ability to walk. And this is just one of a number of incidents we've seen against the community since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. If you just take a look at some of the data, according to the Council on American-Islamic Relations, 
216 percent. That's the increase in complaints about Islamophobia and anti-Arab incidents. And that's just compared to last year. Now, if you break do down those numbers specifically, here's what it looks like. The biggest offenders, free speech violations, employment discrimination, hate crimes, and bullying in school settings. Now, in November, President Biden specifically launched a task force to address this. It's referred to as the first of its kind national strategy to combat Islamophobia. In the special tonight, you'll hear from some individuals who say this is a good start, and you'll hear from other experts who say it's not enough. Now, of course, this also comes at a time when Arab Americans have not only been expressing their fear, but their discontentment with the Biden administration, saying we brought you into the White House in 2020, but in 2023 and leading into 2024, we don't feel supported. So really, the key of this special and these conversations is the fact that behind all of these numbers, Ellison, are people, and we want to center those people tonight. Back to you. It's the end of an era. And no, it's not because Taylor Swift dropped a new album. Disgraced Congressman Republican George Santos has officially been expelled from Congress. That's him leaving Capitol Hill shortly after the vote today. While inside the Capitol, attempts to erase his memory came fast. Capitol staff wasted no time changing the locks to his office and removing his nameplate outside of the door. And Santos wasted no time getting out of there, even leaving the chamber before the vote to expel him had finished. Nearly half of his own party joined 206 Democrats in making Santos just the sixth House member to be voted out of office and only the third since the Civil War. Back in his New York home district, his constituents, they seemed relieved. He got what he deserved. He got what he asked for. It's as simple as that. He he, he tried to push the envelope, and he went right out the window. I think it's a long time coming. I think that this district has gone through a lot of uh, just noise in the media and everything about uh, everything that's been going on. I think that there's been a, a loss of focus on really some of the important issues. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. So, Ryan, Santos is still facing a litany of federal charges. What's next for him? Well, that trial that is pending for him is going to happen in September. He still faces 23 different counts uh, on a, a range of topics, including fraud, money laundering, and election uh, violations as well. Uh, the big issue for George Santos now is that he's not going to have the power uh, of the seat of a seat in Congress as a way to negotiate with federal prosecutors. In the past, federal prosecutors have used a resignation from a seat as a way to perhaps lessen the charges against them. George Santos won't have that option anymore. Uh, as for uh, the Congress, they're going to move on. Uh, the governor of New York has already planned uh, to call a special election. She needs to do that within the next 10 days, and then and it will happen between 70 and 90 days from the day that she announces it. So uh, this uh, is a, the end of kind of a long and sordid chapter here on Capitol Hill that began before George Santos even took the oath of office and came to an end here today. <laughs> So today, Congressman Max Miller made accusations against Santos, right, accusing Santos of defrauding him and his mother. Let's listen to part of their exchange uh, from yesterday, and then we'll talk. You, sir, are a crook. I know I should direct my comments to the chair. I yield back. My colleague wants to come up here, call me a crook. Same colleague who's accused of being a woman beater. Are we, are we really going to ignore the facts that we all have passed and we all have the media coming out against us on a daily basis? Miller is suing his ex-girlfriend for defamation after she accused him of abuse. But Ryan, can you tell us more about what this accusation is against Santos from Miller? Yeah, Allison. And, and first off, you know, I think the backdrop of this is important. It's just an example of why so many of these Republicans at this point just decided it wasn't worth it anymore, because every day there seemed to be a new accusation against George Santos. And even on this day, the day that he was about to be booted from office, a new one uh, came to light. And Max Miller claims that George Santos was using his credit card and his mother's credit card to charge unauthorized charges from his campaign, uh, charges that went above and beyond the FEC government. 
guidelines. And take, to take it a step further, uh, Max Miller's claimed that he and his family have had to spend tens of thousands of dollars in an effort to get that money back. So this was a serious accusation it added to the very long list of accusations. And that's part of the reason you saw his fellow members of Congress say enough is enough. Wow. So I know you said uh, the governor plans to appoint someone to fill Santos's seat, which is empty right now. But what does that process look like? How long will it take? She actually won't appoint someone, else. In, in the House of Representatives, it has to be a special election. So okay. what she needs to do here is in the next 10 days, she has to set that special election. And according to New York law, it has to be between 70 and 90 days from the day of the individual who was in Congress leaves Congress. So that means we sh could see an election here in the next couple of months. So probably by spring, there'll be a new member representing New York's third congressional district. But whether or not it's a Republican is certainly an open question. This is a seat that voted for, by, for President Biden by a nine point margin. It's been represented by Democrats in the past. It will be fiercely contested because as it stands right now, Republicans only have a three seat majority here on Capitol Hill. NBC's Ryan Nobles. Thank you. The first day of December was a busy one for former President Donald Trump. This morning, a federal appeals court decided that Trump can be sued over the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Keep in mind, this ruling does not determine liability one way or another, but it does mean he may have to pay significant damages and legal fees in the future, potentially. Later in the day, a lawyer for Trump appeared in an Atlanta courtroom about the election interference case happening in that state, arguing that the case would have to be delayed for years if he won the White House again. NBC's justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian has the latest. Ellison, today was the first appearance by a lawyer for Donald Trump in the Georgia election subversion case, and there were some remarkable moments. Trump lawyer Stephen Sadow urged the judge to dismiss the case on First Amendment grounds, saying that the prosecution was seeking to criminalize free speech. The judge had rejected that argument when it was made by other defendants in this case, but Sadow cited what he said was additional case law and asked the judge to consider it. Fulton County prosecutors argue, of course, that the First Amendment doesn't give anyone the right to use speech to commit fraud and violate the racketeering statute in an effort to overturn the lawful result of an election. The judge will rule on that motion later. But the most noteworthy moment came during a sharp exchange about scheduling. Sato asked the judge if he could imagine the notion of the Republican nominee for president not being able to campaign for president because he's in some courtroom defending himself. He said that would be the most effective election interference in the history of the United States. In other words, Sato is arguing that simply by running, Donald Trump has made himself immune from prosecution. Now, a prosecutor refuted that, saying that this trial is about the business of Fulton County, Georgia, and that it shouldn't keep Mr. Trump from campaigning. The judge then asked Sato if the trial could go forward if Mr. Trump was elected president in November. And Sato replied that if Mr. Trump wins, this trial could not take place until after he left his term of office. Judge Scott McAfee said this was an issue he's going to take up in greater detail in the new year. The law is actually unsettled about whether a sitting president can be prosecuted criminally, although the Justice Department has long taken the position that a sitting president cannot be indicted federally. Georgia prosecutors have asked the judge to schedule this trial for August, but he hasn't done that, in part to wait and see what happens with the two federal cases pending against the former president, both of which could also go to trial next year. Ellison? NBC's Kendallanian, thank you. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. Elon Musk, he told advertisers to F off. Well, they are, and they do not plan on returning to X. Plus, tis the season, the season where people are constantly sick, what you need to know about COVID, the flu, and RSV, and remembering a trailblazer. Sandra Day O'Connor paved the way as the very first woman on the Supreme Court. We'll take a look back at her incredible life. It's thrilling, in a way, to be the first to do something, the first woman to ever serve on the court. But it's dreadful if you're the last. And if I didn't do the job well, that's what would happen. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Montana was the first state in the U.S. to ban TikTok. Well, today, a federal judge blocked that ban, calling it unconstitutional. It's a blow to critics who have been trying to outlaw the popular video app, but a win for the social media company who says the state went overboard in trying to regulate the app. 
Actress Felicity Huffman is breaking her silence on that admission scandal from a few years ago. Remember, Huffman paid $15,000 to falsify her daughter's SAT score, and in an interview with KABC in LA, she says at the time it felt like the only way to give her daughter a promising future. I had to give my daughter a chance at a future. Um, and so it was sort of like my daughter's future, which meant I had to break the law. Back in 2019, Huffman was sentenced to 14 days in prison, one year of supervised release, and had to complete 250 hours of community service. Philadelphia's city council passed a law that bans people from wearing ski masks in public. Those who are caught wearing them in schools, parks, public transportation, or city-owned buildings will receive a fine. The ban will take effect immediately as long as the mayor signs off on it. An inmate was charged with attempted murder today in the stabbing of ex-Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. John Tursak stabbed Chauvin 22 times at a federal prison in Arizona. Prosecutors say he would have killed Chauvin if officers had not responded quickly. Tursak is currently serving a 30-year sentence for crimes committed while he was in a gang. And a federal appeals court has ordered Texas to remove the buoys along the Rio Grande border. Uh, they say that they are illegal. They were placed there under the direction of Republican Governor Greg Abbott, who has previously said he is prepared to take this fight all the way to the Supreme Court. Also tonight, we are remembering Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. In a statement today, Chief Justice John Roberts praised the late justice, highlighting her, quote, undaunted determination indisputable ability and engaging candor as the first female Supreme Court justice. Here's what Justice O'Connor herself said about taking up that mantle in a 2002 interview on the Today Show. Watch. It's thrilling in a way to be the first to do something, the first woman to ever serve on the court. But it's dreadful if you're the last. And if I didn't do the job well, that's what would happen. NBC's Laura Jarrett has more on the pioneering life and legacy of Sandra Day O'Connor. Keeping a campaign promise to put the first woman on the Supreme Court, Ronald Reagan nominated Sandra Day O'Connor in 1981. The daughter of an Arizona rancher, she came highly recommended as a conservative. It sounded like one during her confirmation hearing. My own view in the area of abortion is that I am opposed to it as a matter of birth control or otherwise. As a justice, at first she criticized the Roe versus Wade abortion ruling, but later joined the majority in a series of cases upholding abortion rights in the 90s. As the first female justice, her every action was scrutinized. The arms get all worn out. Tension, she would later say, was intimidating. It's thrilling in a way to be the first to do something, the first woman to ever serve on the court. But it's dreadful if you're the last. And if I didn't do the job well, that's what would happen. During her 24 years on the court, O'Connor became less tied to a single judicial philosophy. She was sometimes with the conservatives, approving taxpayer-funded vouchers for students at religious schools, voting to end the 2000 Florida recount between George W. Bush and Al Gore and advocating for states' rights against federal control. There is a role that remains for the states, and I am a believer in that designated role. But she joined the court's liberals in upholding affirmative action in college admissions, creating more congressional districts with African-American voters in the majority, and keeping a wall of separation between government and religion. O'Connor was a frequent guest at Washington social events, often dancing with her husband, John and met with student groups, especially young women around the country. But at age 75, she abruptly announced her intention to step down for health reasons. Not hers, but her husband's. She became an advocate for medical research. My beloved husband, John, suffers from Alzheimer's. He's had it for a long time now, and he's um, not in very good shape. John O'Connor died at age 79 in 2009. She remained active, urging states to do away with elections for judges, which she said made the courts too political. Sandra Day O'Connor was a pioneer, the first female justice who held the court center for more than a generation. Laura Jarrett, NBC News, at the Supreme Court.
Joining me now is Evan Thomas. He's the author of First, Sandra Day O'Connor. Evan, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Let me just start big picture for you. How are you reflecting on the life and legacy of Sandra Day O'Connor? We forget what a big deal it was. I mean, the court had been all male for 200 years. So she was the first, and as she said, often, she didn't, she didn't want to be the last. Uh, she's pretty happy, or she was pretty happy to find out today that there are four women justices. So that's a huge change right there. Uh, she was a tough, tough person. And, you know, in her very first argument, first time she asked a question, the lawyer talked right out, who's a man, talked right over her. And she did feel a little bit disrespected, a little dissed. But, you know, that was not her style. She didn't say dissed for long. She just jumped in there, and she was very independent-minded. She could have been going to the left. She could have gone with the right. She cut her own course uh, and, and, as a result, had a lot of power. Hmm. You know, we were struck by something you wrote in the Washington Post. You said this, quote, over the course of her long ascent from ranch girl to the first female justice on the Supreme Court, she had come to understand that self-restraint and civility would make her more not less powerful. Talk to us a little more about how that shaped her approach on the bench and what lessons you think there are in her life and practice for young women and really any young person today. Well, you know, she was very smart about not getting into stupid fights, mm -hmm. stupid, petty, ego-driven fights. She just avoided them. Now, that doesn't mean that she was a pushover by any means. She knew when to stand up, but she picked her fights. And she was very smart about this. She could tease Nino Scalia, who was her adversary in many things. And in Chambers once, you know, he was going on about affirmative action. She said, oh, Nino, you know, how do you think I got my job? But in public, she was careful not to criticize him. In fact, once a, one of her clerks was writing in an opinion, a clever rejoinder, you know, a smart uh, response to uh, Scalia, she cut it out. She just crossed it out because she didn't want to pick stupid fights. That gave her more power to be restrained, to be even-handed, actually enhanced her power. All right. Evan Thomas, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and insights. Thanks for having me. Tempers are flared and accusations flew during last night's debate between the governors of Florida and California. In fact, the word liar was used more than 20 times between Ron DeSantis and Gavin Newsom. Thanks to our friends at Meet the Press for counting. Here's moderator Kristen Welker with some of the highlights. What are you talking about? You're just when jabbering. It comes to this. I know no, you're, you're like just to jabber. By the way, those Overnight, a fiery face-off between two top governors with presidential overtones. He's joined at the hip with Biden and Harris. You're nothing but a bully. Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, who's running for the GOP nomination in 2024, taking on California's Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom, who's backing President Biden's re-election. There were fireworks from the start when DeSantis sharply criticized Newsom for visiting a fancy French restaurant at the height of the COVID pandemic. He's imposed restrictions on his own people while exempting himself from those restrictions and going to the French laundry while his people were suffering. The governors clashed over border security. Newsom criticizing DeSantis's controversial move last year, sending migrants to Martha's Vineyard. You're trolling folks and trying to find migrants to play political games, to try to get some news and attention so you can out Trump Trump. And by the way, How's that going for you, Ron? You're down 41 points in your own home state. DeSantis firing back, accusing Newsom of being soft on border security. This is the vision of Biden, Harris, Newsom, open borders. But it was the issue of abortion that prompted some of the sharpest exchanges. Newsom slamming DeSantis for signing a six-week abortion ban into law in Florida. Before women even know they're pregnant, Ron, even Donald Trump said it was too extreme. Well, I believe in a culture of life. The biggest question of the night, the political future of both men. Hannity pressing Newsom on whether he would replace President Biden on the ticket if asked. It's not even it's not even optional. He's doing fantastically. He says Joe Biden is 100 percent up to the job. You know that that's not true. Our thanks to Kristen Welker for that report. Coming up, it is not just COVID and the flu you have to watch out for this winter. Pneumonia and strep throat, they are spreading too. What you need to know. 
But first, you got to see this. Macaulay Culkin got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame today. And who better to join him than his movie mom, Catherine O'Hara? The reason families all over the world can't let a year go by without watching and loving Home Alone together is because of Macaulay Culkin. Macaulay, congratulations. You so deserve your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And thank you for including me, your fake mom who left you home alone not once but twice <laughs> to share in this happy occasion. I'm so proud of you. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. A half million dollar bail has been set for the man accused of killing two Nevada state troopers with his car. This morning, 46-year-old Jamarcus Williams was hit with two counts of DUI, resulting in death, among other charges. Police say he ran down both troopers on Interstate 15. They'd stopped to check on a driver who appeared to be asleep behind the wheel. Prosecutors say Williams was on the run from security at a nearby casino before the crash. For months now, the police department in Antioch, California, has been mired in allegations of racism that includes racist slurs and threatening to harm the city's black mayor, Lamar Thorpe. Well, now Thorpe is making his first public comment, saying he will no longer, quote, be quiet about it. Several Antioch officers in question were federally indicted on civil rights violations back in August. And a number of Jewish groups are suing UC California Berkeley, accusing the university of fostering anti-Semitism. The lawsuit alleges Jewish students have faced violence and harassment since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. University officials strongly refute those allegations, calling them inaccurate, adding they do not reflect, quote, the facts of what is actually happening on campus. A new warning from the CDC in regards to those viruses spreading across the country. We're talking about COVID, RSV, the flu, pneumonia, and strep. It's the season for get-togethers, which means it's the season for sickness as well. Dr. Natalie Azar has tips on how to handle it. Tis the season for coughs, <laughs> chills, and sneezing. But why is it always in the winter? It probably has to do with the drier air crowding and uh, maybe the cold effects on our respiratory and our immune systems. And why dry air? Because the dry air makes it easier for contaminated water droplets from coughs and sneezes to travel freely, this can cause more infection. So what infections are we talking about? Well, COVID hospitalizations may be down this season, but those viruses are still spreading, with the CDC seeing a jump in COVID, RSV, and the flu. It seems like everyone is talking about RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus, the most common respiratory cause of hospital admissions for children. In fact, 97 to 99 percent get this illness by age two, but only about three percent end up in the hospital. But children aren't the only ones affected. Up to 10,000 adults actually can die from RSV. Are we seeing more than what we would normally be seeing? Or is this still part of that post-COVID kind of, aha, we need to pay attention to RSV phenomenon? I think it's a combination of things. Whether RSV is really an increasing problem or whether it's increasing awareness is not clear, but we do have more tools at our hands. Those tools include testing and vaccinations, which are available to children, those who are immunocompromised or pregnant, and the elderly. Experts say if you're around those vulnerable and feeling sick, you should test. That's because while RSV usually mimics the same symptoms of the common cold, in severe cases, it can cause the inflammation of the lungs or pneumonia. That can lead to hospitalization with all of these respiratory viruses potentially leading to post-viral fatigue syndromes. These include long COVID and long cold. Another reason why prevention is key, long COVID can happen at any time. It doesn't always happen with just the first infection. It can happen after a second or third. And one of the more common infections we see every year, bronchitis, is a lower respiratory infection or what's commonly referred to as a chest cold. People usually mean acute bronchitis caused by a viral infection. This usually goes away on its own. But there's another form of chronic bronchitis caused by a bacterial infection. So how do you know which one you have? Chronic bronchitis is something characterized by much more persistent symptoms and is often uh, found in people who are a little older. Bronchitis is considered chronic if someone has a mucus producing cough at least three months per year, two years in a row. While symptoms for all these viruses can feel like the common cold, rhinovirus or adenovirus, it's important to keep in mind that they can make others more sick and are contagious.
If you're already having symptoms, you know, think twice about going into a gathering. There are masks that we can wear more comfortably and for longer periods of time. Just being thoughtful about uh, how we manage uh, risk is probably the most important thing we can do. Great. And obviously never to forget the old fashioned washing your hands and not touching you. your face and things like that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you for that report. Tonight, pressure is mounting on the FDA to do more about lead poisoning in children. A company called Wanabana is at the center of it all. They make a product called apple cinnamon F fruit puree pouches. It's a mouthful. When it was, uh, it was actually recalled last month after there were reports of elevated levels of lead found in it. So now the FDA is saying that there have been 52 reported cases of children with elevated levels of lead in their blood, potentially linked to these same pouches. NBC News senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn has the story. Stephanie, read a book. We first met Ricky and Sarah Callahan and their 14-month-old Rudy last month. The Callahans were shocked when Rudy was diagnosed with lead poisoning after a routine one-year checkup in August. Never in a million years did I imagine that my son would be affected by lead poisoning. Rudy is among the nearly 60 children across the country who've had elevated blood lead levels after eating Wanabana's apple cinnamon fruit purees. How many of these apple sauce pouches do you think he had eaten? They were a regular part of his diet. Doctors say lead poisoning can lead to developmental delays and IQ loss in children. Just this week, Wanabana, which voluntarily recalled its cinnamon applesauce pouches in late October, pointed to an Ecuador-based supplier of cinnamon as the possible cause, saying it was releasing the information in the interest of public health. The FDA said the cinnamon supplier does not import directly into the U.S., and the agency is working with Ecuadorian authorities to determine if the spice could have been used in other products shipped here. But that doesn't give much comfort to the Callahans. Ricky and I were the two people that he relied on for his food, and we fed that to him. It makes me feel guilty. Like, all, all we wanted was the best for our baby, and he's been lead poisoned. It's not the first time experts have been concerned. A 2021 congressional report revealed dangerous levels of heavy metals like lead, arsenic, cadmium and mercury in a wide range of baby foods, often absorbed by fruits and vegetables from soil and water. This is a big problem that requires solutions at all different levels. FDA needs to set protective standards. Food manufacturers need to test what's coming in and what's in their finished foods. And parents also need to pay attention and make choices to help lower their children's exposures to these toxic metals. In January, the FDA announced proposed industry limits on lead in baby food. But that guidance isn't expected to be finalized until 2025. And why has it taken so long for the FDA to even get to this point? FDA is a big bureaucratic agency, but it's not going to move quickly. And in the meantime, children are exposed every day. So what should parents do? Houlihan says study which ingredients tend to carry more heavy metals risks, like root vegetables and rice. Don't assume homemade baby food is safer and make sure kids eat different types of food from various brands. If you're serving the same food every single day to your child, you could be accidentally concentrating a particular toxin in your child's diet. Not every state requires lead testing for young children, but experts say that is the best way to know if a child has been exposed to lead. Rudy's lead levels are going down, but his parents say he's showing signs of a speech delay. This is something that he will have to live with for the rest of his life. This week, the Callahans filed suit against Wanabana, and they say they hope other parents don't have to go through the same ordeal. What action do you want to see? I'd like to see a more rigorous testing so things like this don't happen in the future. <laughs> NBC's Vicki Wynn, thanks so much. Still to come, a 70-year-old woman just gave birth to twins in Uganda. Those details are next, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. It looks like 2023 is set to be the hottest year in human history. That announcement came today at the United Nations Climate Summit in Dubai, with scientists there saying they are, quote, virtually certain of it and hoping that this report will force countries to speed up their transition away from fossil fuels that are heating up the planet. 
In Italy, red hot lava lights up the night sky as Mount Etna erupts again. It's Europe's tallest volcano with an eruption column estimated to be more than 14 feet above sea level. Local officials say Mount Etna has been in a constant state of activity since 2013. And in Uganda, a 70-year-old woman has given birth to twins this week. She delivered a boy and a girl via C-section after receiving IVF treatment. The babies were born a bit premature, but they are currently in stable condition. The new mom is one of the oldest women to give birth, but not the oldest. In 2019, a 73-year-old Indian woman gave birth to twins, also following IVF treatment. Today is World AIDS Day, and a new report shows adolescent girls are bearing the brunt of this epidemic. The report from UNICEF finds that nearly 100,000 girls ages 10 to 19 were infected with HIV last year. That's almost 2,000 new infections a week. And though those numbers are down from a decade ago, the report finds that girls were still more than twice as likely to contract HIV than boys last year. Let's bring in Dr. Uh, Uche Blackstock, an HIV specialist and reach. Actually, Oni, it is Dr. Blackstock's sister. I apologize. I thought that must be a typo. I know her. It's very nice to have you, Dr. Oni Blackstock, whose sister we are also a very big fan of. Um, <laughs> you were the founder and executive director at Health Justice. Uh, I want to show our audience something here to start. So there are over 1.5 million children under the age of 15 living with HIV right now. About 87% of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. Why is that? Yes, well, thank you so much for having me on. And I should just say, if you're going to confuse me with someone, I'm <laughs> very happy to be confused with my amazing twin sister, Uche. Um, yes, so, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is has been really the epicenter um, of the HIV epidemic, and in particular in terms of its impact on both children um, as well as adolescents. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, sort of the, the economic situation, um, the entrenched poverty, obviously, as a result of sort of post-colonization. Um, but that has really been um, sort of a, a, an area where we're wanting to make sure that we are investing in the health systems that are needed to ensure that, you know, women have access to or pregnant people have access to effective HIV treatment to prevent transmission um, to their children while they're pregnant or while they're breastfeeding, um, and that where we have access um, to HIV treatment for um, children as well as adults. So where is the world in terms of safe and effective HIV and AIDS treatments? I mean, have we progressed in a meaningful way or at the rate that is most ideal? Like, could we be doing this a lot faster? Well, we've made tremendous progress towards ending the HIV epidemic. Um, and in particular, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have seen some of the largest um, reductions in terms of new HIV infections and HIV-related deaths. Um, that said, we also have incredibly effective HIV treatment and prevention tools like PrEP, pre-exposure, prophylaxis. It can be taken as a pill um, or an injectable or also a vaginal ring by people who are HIV negative um, to prevent HIV infection. The issue is we have these amazing tools. However, there are still many communities throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, throughout the world, including here in the United States, where people do not have access to these powerful tools. So in terms of sort of this home stretch to the end of the epidemic, we really need to make sure that we are sort of investing, have the political will, um, and we are investing the resources needed to ensure access to those communities um, and those countries in particular that are at our highest risk. We know with the COVID-19 pandemic um, that had a financial impact on many countries, including low and moderate income countries, as well as sort of donations in terms of HIV treatment from higher income countries. So things have been really challenging. We've seen some stagnation. And so we really are wanting to call on sort of countries around the world, particularly donors, to sort of um, double down and reinvest um, in ensuring HIV treatment and prevention access throughout the world. Dr. Oni Blackstock, thank you so very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And it is not typically for a company to tell advertisers, it's not typical rather, to go F themselves. But Elon Musk is not always conventional. Next, a look at the future of X.
if somebody's gonna try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go f yourself. But go f yourself. Is that clear? I hope it is. Thank goodness it is Friday because it's been a week for Elon Musk. On Wednesday at a New York Times summit, what we just watched there, Musk gave that message to advertisers ditching X, the company he owns. Now let's bring you up to speed. Two weeks ago, Musk expressed support for an anti-Semitic post on X, calling it, quote, the actual truth. He got a lot of backlash for that. Then to try and make amends, Musk traveled 7,000 miles to Israel this Monday and met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. But the fallout from his comments continued, and the exodus of advertisers on X only grew. Musk apologized for those tweets on Wednesday. Here's what he had to say. I'm sorry for that, that, that tweet or post. It was foolish of me. Of the 30,000, it might be literally the worst and dumbest tweet post that I've ever done. It looks like that apology was not good enough, as advertisers say they've had enough of Elon Musk and will not return to X. So is this the start of the end? Joining us now is NBC News tech correspondent Jake Ward. Jake, with all of these huge advertisers pulling out, what is the new advertising strategy for X? And let me pose that last question to you. Is this the beginning of the end for Elon Musk and X as we knew it? You know, certainly it is the, the you know, it, it, is, it, it, it feels like it can never go lower, uh, sorry, lo lower, right? Mm -hmm. also, I mean, this is the thing, right? You, you could not imagine any other CEO in American public life um, uh, acting in the way publicly that Elon Musk has and either, you know, not being fired by a board or uh, suffering such, you know, financial fallout that the company just falls apart. Well, I just don't think we can evaluate Elon Musk in the way that we evaluate other public figures. I mean, certainly the damage being done at X is is not to be, uh, you know, overstated here. Like, you know, not only have we seen uh, Disney and Warner Brothers and our parent company Comcast pulling out of advertising on that platform, you know, Walmart has now joined those uh, ranks uh, after this appearance on Wednesday. Because once he tells a room full of the top advertising dollar wielders in, in the world, are you? to go F themselves. I mean, what other choice do those people have? Um, you know, but is it the end of X? It's not at all clear. I mean, on a dollars and cents basis, this guy can afford to keep it going. And, you know, the tens of millions of dollars lost in advertising revenue is the lifeblood of the company. But does he truly care? He doesn't really seem to. So, you know, the, the bigger question here, is there a strategy here? I don't think so. I think he made his bones in these other companies like Tesla, like SpaceX, being a, a, a very brilliant attention getter. And so perhaps the logic for him is just whatever attention I can get is good attention. But certainly in terms of the balance sheet of the company, it does not seem to be serving anybody's purposes. Else. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned some of the other companies he runs and owns. He owns Tesla, SpaceX, XAI, Neuralink, and that's just a few of them. And they all still seem to be running fairly successfully. How come we see this kind of very different approach and result with X and there doesn't seem to be the same carryover to these other companies? Well, so so on the one hand, right, it's because Twitter now X is is an advertising run you know media platform, right? And he's never run one of those before. He's a product person. So you know, steel turned into rockets, and you know, mined materials turned into batteries, turned into cars. That's what he is is you know that's what he makes. So he's never had to please anybody except the suppliers uh, he bought things from uh, for those product companies. So that's one reason that the rules just seem to be different, and the outcome seems to be different for for X. But then, you know, the thing is, it's not as insulated as it used to be. You know, once upon a time, I mean, still, he's he's not fundamentally, you know, the Tesla board is not threatening him or anything because, you know, that company made over 200 billion, excuse me, $20 billion last year in profit. So, you know, the money is good. That said, the effects of his misbehavior are sloshing over into these other companies. You have him going to Israel on this seeming apology tour and then getting Starlink, his, his space-based internet company, entwined in the situation there by denying... Uh, Gaza, the potential of being connected to the internet through that, getting around the Israeli blockade unless the Israeli Ministry of Communications allows it. You know, he struck that deal while he's there ostensibly trying to burnish the reputation of X and his personal reputation. So, and, and you know, as I understand it from people who are, are close to him, 
there is now some reputational harm to people that he can hire. Once upon a time, you had young progressive engineers who wanted to work on climate change coming to work mm -hmm. at Tesla. Now it's not clear that those, you know, those people look at him and think, what is he about? What's his vision? There's a bunch of bumper stickers that are going around right now in which Tesla owners are actually putting bumper stickers on their car that say, I bought this before I knew Elon was crazy. So there's some, there's some reputational stuff that does seem to slosh over into the rest of, the, of his businesses, but not so much so that it in any way really endangers them, at least not so much that their boards are in any way you know, offering consequences to the CEO. Well, I'm sure we will continue this conversation down the road. Jake Ward, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Finally, let's get your weekend started with 60 Seconds of Joy. Tonight, that's thanks to a group of teens from Texas who started a charity called Jingle Bell Mistletoe. They're giving back by encouraging others to show a little love. Literally, Noelle Walker from our NBC affiliate KXAS has the story. <laughs> Tis the season for bells, bows, they have our logo on them, which is really fun, and mistletoe. There's a lot of people who I see around town who I just know because they've bought mistletoe every year. The Mistle Crew is hard at work. We're trying to break the Guinness World Record for the most couples kissing under mistletoe. Jingle Bell Mistletoe set the record in 2018 at Clyde Warren Park when they got 340 couples to kiss under the mistletoe. It started with Stella when she was just six, wanting to help Hurricane Sandy victims. I uh, told my parents that I was really upset about it and that I was sad that I was six because that meant that I couldn't do anything about it. They said, well, I don't know, you should, you should follow that impulse and, and do it. And um, here we are. 12 years later and more than $400,000 raised. Tis the season of giving. It's just fun and I, I enjoy every second of it. Our thanks to Noelle Walker from KXAS for that report. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you Monday, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.